Hi, I'm Charles, and you're watching The State of the Republic. Today, we have a State of the Republic special report on the history of the Southern strategy and Republican racism. The reason why this turned into this. Now first, some context about the historical politics of race in America. As Republicans will never tire of saying, Democrats used to be very racist. Race was used to divide poor whites from blacks and prevent them from electing people that would serve the interests of the common man instead of wealthy reactionaries. Southern Democrats used the Klan and Jim Crow laws to systemically disenfranchise black voters. Blacks remained Republicans for many decades, with their traditional loyalty being to the party of Lincoln. However, by the 1930s, black voters were defecting from their traditional Republican loyalties thanks to the positive economic effects of the New Deal. Seeing a political opening, Northern Democrats began to back civil rights in addition to New Deal policies in the hopes of gaining electoral support. Furthermore, the liberals who were gaining increasing prominence within the Democratic Party saw civil rights as a moral imperative for the party. The beginning of the transformation of the Democratic Party on civil rights began in earnest in 1948, when future Vice President Hubert Humphrey gave a well-received speech supporting a stronger civil rights plank in the Democratic platform that year. Friends, delegate, I do not believe that there can be any compromise on the guarantees of the civil rights which we have mentioned in the Minority Report. In spite, in spite of my desire for unanimous agreement on the entire platform, in spite of my desire to see everybody here in honest and unanimous agreement, there are some matters which I think must be stated clearly and without qualification. There can be no hedging. The newspaper headlines are wrong. There will be no hedging, and there will be no watering down, if you please, of the instruments and the principles of the civil rights program. <laughs> to those who say, my friends, to those who say that we are rushing this issue of civil rights, I say to them, we are 172 years late. <laughs> to those who say, to those who say that this civil rights program is an infringement on states' rights, I say this, the time has arrived in America for the Democratic Party to get out of the shadows of states' rights and to walk forthrightly into the bright sunshine of human rights. People, people, human beings, this is the issue of the 20th century. Plank was passed, and in reaction to this, and to the Truman administration's desegregation of the military, Southern Democrats bolted from the party and nominated a separate presidential ticket under the state's rights Democratic Party label with then-Governor Strom Thurmond. There's not enough troops in the army to force the Southern people to break down segregation and admit the Negro race into our theaters, into our spring pools, into our homes, and into our... Southern Democrats hoped to deny President Truman an electoral college majority, forcing the election to the House where they could draw concessions against civil rights. However, the decision backfired when the National Democratic ticket picked up enough votes anyway, showing that nationally, Democrats did not have to pick up all of the Solid South to win. In 1960, Democrats nominated John F. Kennedy, who was a Northern pro-civil rights Democrat. In response, Southern Democrats again bolted from the party partially, with Mississippi and Alabama nominating electors unpledged to Democratic nominee John F. Kennedy. Again, Southerners hoped to force some kind of deadlock where Kennedy would have to make concessions to the South in exchange for enough support to be president. This went about as well as the first time they tried it in 1948. Kennedy was able to win an electoral college majority, and Kennedy's victories in the key state of Illinois and Texas put him well over the top and make, made it unnecessary for him to bargain for Southern support. Kennedy supported civil rights with substantive action, ordering federal marshals into the South to protect protesters, and federalized the Alabama National Guard to prevent segregationist Governor George Wallace from blo blocking university admissions to black students. Kennedy also backed what would eventually become the Civil Rights Act of 1964, speaking for it publicly. We are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and is as clear as the American Constitution. The heart of the question is, 
whether all Americans are to be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities, whether we are going to treat our fellow Americans as we want to be treated. If an American, because his skin is dark, cannot eat lunch in a restaurant open to the public, if he cannot send his children to the best public school available, if he cannot vote for the public officials who represent him, if, in short, he cannot enjoy the full and free life which all of us want, then who among us would be content to have the color of his skin changed and stand in his place? Who among us would then be content with the counsels of patience and delay? One hundred years of delay have passed since President Lincoln freed the slaves, yet their heirs, their grandsons, are not fully free. They are not yet freed from the bonds of injustice. They are not yet, not yet freed from social and economic oppression. And this nation, for all its hopes and all its boasts, will not be fully free until all its citizens are free. Unfortunately, President Kennedy would never live to see a civil rights bill become law because he was assassinated in 1963, and Vice President Lyndon Johnson became president. Johnson was from Texas and was widely perceived as a conservative. As Senate Majority Leader, Johnson had previously secured the passage of the 1957 Civil Rights Act over the filibuster of South Carolina Senator Strom Thurmond, but he had severely watered down the bill in order to pass it. President Johnson proceeded to defy initial expectations, however, and fully backed a strong civil rights bill. President Johnson managed to jam the 1964 Civil Rights Act through Congress, crushing Southern Democrats' objections. President Johnson signed the act in the presence of congressional and civil rights leaders, making this speech before signing the bill. Yet those who founded our country knew that freedom would be secure only if each generation thought to renew and enlarge its meaning. From the Minutemen at Concord to the soldiers in Vietnam, each generation has been equal to that trust. Americans of every race and color have died in battle to protect our freedom. Americans of every race and color have worked to build a nation of widening opportunities. Now, our generation of Americans has been called on to continue the unending search for justice within our own borders. We believe that all men are created equal, yet many are denied equal treatment. We believe that all men have certain unalienable rights, yet many Americans do not enjoy those rights. We believe that all men are entitled to the blessings of liberty, yet millions are being deprived of those blessings, not because of their own failures, but because of the color of their skin. The reasons are deeply embedded in history and tradition and the nature of man. We can understand without rancor or hatred how this all happened but it cannot continue. Our Constitution, the foundation of our Republic, forbids it. The principles of our freedom forbid it. Morality forbids it. And the law I will sign tonight forbids it. President Johnson knew he was going to lose the South, saying on the night of the bill's passage, I think we just delivered the South to the Republican Party for a long time to come. Needless to say, Southern Democrats reacted extremely negatively to this bill. Further discord occurred at the 1964 Democratic National Convention in Atlantic, in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Pro-civil rights Democrats from Mississippi attempted to be seated as delegates in place of the regular Mississippi delegation, which had been elected in an effectively segregated primary. Eventually, a compromise was worked out. But some southern delegations refused to play ball, and the Mississippi and Alabama delegations walked out. Further angering the South was President Johnson's pick of Minnesota Senator and prominent civil rights backer 
Hubert Humphrey as a running mate. That year's Republican nominee was Senator Barry Goldwater. Goldwater was correctly considered an extra conservative extremist, and his views on a variety of topics were extremely unpopular. Goldwater was feared to be unstable and joked about lobbing nuclear bombs into the Kremlin men's room. Johnson played on that, those sort of fears with this ad. Other, or we must die. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. However, Goldwater as a senator had voted against the 1964 Civil Rights Act and had also received the support of Senator Strom Thurmond, who had by then had switched parties to the Republicans, stating that segregationists had no place in the Democratic Party after LBJ's civil rights legislation and the nomination of Humphrey for the vice presidency. These factors were enough for most of the Deep South to defect from the Democratic Party, despite Goldwater's opposition to much of the New Deal policies that were greatly beneficial and popular in the South. Johnson crushed Goldwater in a 61-38 landslide nationally, with the only state outside of the South that Goldwater won being his home state of Arizona. Moderate Republicans defected en masse from Goldwater, helped along by ads like this. I don't know just why they wanted to call this a confession. I, I certainly don't feel guilty about being a Republican. I've always been a Republican. My father is, his father was, the whole family is a Republican family. I voted for Dwight Eisenhower the first time I ever voted. I voted for Nixon the last time. But when we come to Senator Goldwater, now it seems to me we're up against a, a very different kind of a man. This man scares me. Now, maybe I'm wrong. A friend of mine has said to me, listen, just because uh, a man sounds a little irresponsible during a campaign doesn't mean he's going to act irresponsibly. You know that theory that the White House makes the man. I don't buy that. You know what I think makes a president? I mean, aside from his, his judgment, his experience, are the men behind him, his, 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 uh, his advisors, the cabinet. And so many men with strange ideas are, are working for Goldwater. You, you hear a lot about what these guys are against. They seem to be against just about everything. But what are they for? The hardest thing for me about this whole campaign is to sort out one Goldwater statement from another. A, a reporter will go to Senator Goldwater and say, Senator, on such and such a day, you said, and I quote, blah, 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 whatever it is, end quote. And then Goldwater says, well, I wouldn't put it that way. I, I can't follow that. I, was he serious when he did put it that way? Is he serious when he says he wouldn't put it that way? I, I, I just don't get it. Uh, a president ought to mean what he says. President Johnson, now, Johnson at least is, is, is talking about facts. He says, look, we got the, the tax cut bill and because of that you get to carry home X number of dollars more every payday. We got the nuclear test ban, and, and because of that, there's X percent less radioactivity in the food. But, but Goldwater, often you can't, I, I, I can't figure out just what Goldwater means by the things he says. I read now where he says, a, a wave, a craven fear of death is sweeping across America. What is that supposed to mean? If he means that people don't want to fight a nuclear war, he's right. I don't. When I read some of these things that Goldwater says about uh, total victory, I get a little worried, you know? I, I, wish, I wish I was as sure that Goldwater is against war as I am that he's against some of these other things. I wish I could believe that he has the imagination to, to be able to just shut his eyes and picture what this country would look like after a nuclear war.
Sometimes I, I wish I'd been at that convention in San Francisco. I mean, I wish I'd been a delegate. I really do, because I, I would have fought, you know? And I wouldn't have worried so much about party unity, because if you unite behind a man you don't believe in, it's a lie. I tell you, those people who got control of that convention, who are they? I mean, when the head of the Ku Klux Klan, when all these weird groups come out in favor of the candidate of my party, either they're not Republicans or I'm not, I thought about just not voting in this election, just staying home, but you can't do that because that's, that's saying you, you don't care who wins, and, and I do care. I think my party made a bad mistake in San Francisco, and I'm going to have to vote against that mistake on the 3rd of November. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. In addition, Goldwater won none of the new South states like North Carolina and Texas that were considered more moderate on racial issues. With President Johnson's crushing victory in 1964, he was able to pass much of his legislative agenda, including the Voting Rights Act of 1965, Medicare, Medicaid, public broadcasting, public housing assistance, and much, much more. Johnson laid out his vision for the Great Society thusly. The challenge of the next half century is whether we have the wisdom to use that wealth to enrich and elevate our national life and to advance the quality of our American civilization. Your imagination and your initiative and your indignation will determine whether we build a society where progress is the servant of our needs or a society where old values and new visions are buried under unbridled growth. For in your time, we have the opportunity to move not only toward the rich society and the powerful society, but upward to the great society. The great society rests on abundance and liberty for all. It demands an end to poverty and racial injustice to which we're totally committed in our time. Through the passage of Great Society legislation, Johnson sought to ex extend the benefits of America and its prosperity to non-whites, in particular blacks. Politically, this meant that those kind of social programs became increasingly linked with minorities, generating white hostility. The New Deal was fine because whites were perceived as the primary beneficiaries. The Great Society was not because minorities were seen as the primary beneficiaries. The fact that much of Great Society legislation benefited everyone was immaterial. The perception was already in the minds of whites that their tax dollars were going to undeserving minorities. By 1968, increasing domestic turmoil combined with the Vietnam War caused America to sour on President Johnson, and he chose not to run for re-election. After the assassination of Robert Kennedy on the night he won the California primary, Vice President Humphrey accepted the Democratic nomination as what is rightly regarded as one of the most disorderly conventions in modern history. Republican Richard Nixon returned after his previous defeat in 1960 to run for president again. Nixon noticed that it, four years before, the Deep South had went Republican for the first time as a protest against the passage of civil rights. Nixon's campaign began crafting and using a Southern strategy to appeal to the same conservative Southern whites who had traditionally voted Democratic. Nixon talked about op his opposition to forced busing and great society spending, and he talked about the quote-unquote silent majority and law and order in order to hopefully peel off enough traditionally Democratic votes to win the South. Complicating matters further was Alabama Governor George Wallace entering the race as a third-party candidate. Today, I have stood where once Jefferson Davis stood and took an oath to my people. It is very appropriate that from this cradle of the Confederacy, this very heart of the great Anglo-Saxon Southland, that today we sound the drum for freedom as have our generation of forebears before us done time and again down through history. Let us rise to the call of freedom-loving blood that is in us and send our answer to the tyranny that clanks its chains upon the South. In the name of the greatest people that have ever trod this earth, 
I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny, and I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. Wallace ran a much more explicitly racist and segregationist campaign and split the conservative vote with Nixon. Wallace won much of the South, as well as substantial percentages in the North. However, Richard Nixon's combination of race baiting and treasonous undermining of the Vietnam peace talks was enough to make him president. As president, Nixon twice attempted to nominate Southern conservative justices to the Supreme Court, though both attempts were shot down. Nixon also started the war on drugs for rather political reasons. His own advisor, John Ehrlichman, stated, The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Do we know that we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. Nixon Chief of Staff H.R. Halderman also noted that Nixon, quote, emphasized that you have to face the fact that the whole problem is really the blacks. The key is to devise a system that recognized this while appearing not to. In 1972, Nixon defeated liberal Democratic Senator George McGovern of South Dakota in a landslide, carrying every state except Massachusetts. The election was the first election where Republicans had been able to fully sweep the South. By 1974, Nixon had resigned from office over the Watergate scandal and Gerald Ford had become president. Democratic nominee Jimmy Carter was able to temporarily reverse the South's Republican trend as a mo moderate to conservative white Southern Democratic governor. By 1980, Southerners were increasingly unhappy with Carter for his enforcement of desegregation, particularly the IRS's then-recent revocation of tax-exempt status for racially discriminatory religious schools that the South had been using to maintain segregation. Former Governor of California and senile savant Ronald Reagan was the Republican nominee in 1980 and ran a strikingly racist campaign against Carter. Reagan had a history of racism as Governor of California, backing a state ballot initiative to allow housing discrimination. Reagan kicked off his campaign after the convention by going to Philadelphia, Mississippi, where three civil rights workers had been lynched in the 1960s to give a speech supporting states' rights. Reagan also complained about imaginary Cadillac driving welfare queens and young bucks buying T-bone steaks with food stamps. For those who may not be aware, buck was a term to use to refer to physically intimidating young black men. Reagan denounced the 1965 Voting Rights Act as, quote, humiliating to the South. This strategy worked quite well, and combined with his treasonous undermining of President Carter's efforts to negotiate for the Iran hostages' release was enough to elect him president. Reagan, as president, consistently pushed and executed racist policies. Reagan attempted to restore tax exemptions for segregated private schools and also had his DOJ soft-pedal desegregation in general. Reagan consistently fought attempts to sanction the apartheid South African government. Reagan vetoed a bipartisan bill sanctioning the South African government only to have his veto overridden by both houses of Congress. Reagan sought to politicize affirmative action policies, previously a bipartisan consensus policy designed to help minorities. Reagan's DOJ began attacking it as discriminatory against whites, using ad campaigns and filing a cases against it at the Supreme Court. The 1984 GOP platform contained these words. We will resist efforts to replace equal rights with, discrim with discriminatory quota systems and preferential treatment. Quotas are the most insidious form of discrimination. Reverse discrimination against the innocent. Needless to say, in this context, innocent meant white. Reagan won re-election by a landslide, carrying nearly two-thirds of whites. By contrast, blacks voted 90% against Reagan. Reagan, in 1987, then vetoed the Civil Rights Restoration Act, which required groups receiving federal funding to be compliant with federal civil rights laws. His veto was again overridden by both houses of Congress. In 1988, with Republican nominee George H.W. Bush behind in the polls, Republicans released attack ads against Democratic nominee Michael Dukakis, associating him with black convicted murderer Willie Horton. The, black, the Republican Party pulled out all the stops to convince America that Dukakis was pro-black murderer and anti-white family. A prominent political advisor to both Reagan and Bush was Lee Atwater, who said this about racial politics. Here's how I would approach that issue as a, as a, as a statistician or a political scientist, or no, as a psychologist, which I'm not, is, is how abstract you, you handle the race thing. In other words, you start out, and, you know, now y'all aren't quoting me. You start out in 1954 by saying nigger, nigger, nigger. 
1968, you can't say nigger, that hurts your backfire. So you say stuff like uh, forced busing, states' rights, and all that stuff. And you're getting so abstract now, you're talking about cutting taxes and all of these things you're talking about are totally economic things, and the byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than whites. And subconsciously, maybe that is part of it. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that if it is getting that abstract and that coded, uh, that, that, we're, that we're doing away with the racial problem one way or the other. Uh, you follow me? Because obviously sitting around saying uh, we want to cut taxes, we want to cut this, and we want is much more abstract than, than even the busing thing. Uh, and a hell of a lot more abstract than never, never. You know. In 1990, South Carolina Republican Senator Jesse Helms, in order to assure his own re-election, ran the strikingly racist hands ad in his re-election campaign against Democratic candidate Harvey Gantt. You needed that job, and you were the best qualified. But they had to give it to a minority because of a racial quota. Is that really fair? Harvey Gantt says it is. Gantt supports Ted Kennedy's racial quota law that makes the color of your skin more important than your qualifications. You'll vote on this issue next Tuesday. For racial quotas, Harvey Gantt. Against racial quotas, Jesse Helms. Republicans continue to tax on minorities into the rest of the 1990s, constantly calling for even more tough-on-crime drug policies and more cuts to public assistance, both of which are targeted against racial minorities. By 2000, it was time for Bush the Elder's idiot kid shrub to have a turn in the White House. Bush was considered the front-runner for the Republican nomination, but John McCain won the New Hampshire primary and was proved, proving to be more of a threat than originally thought. In response, Bush's campaign spread rumors in South Carolina ahead of the crucial primary there, that John McCain had an illegitimate black daughter. John McCain and his wife had actually adopted a child from Bangladesh, but the damage was done. McCain was crushed in the South Carolina primary and did not go on to win the nomination. Since the 9-11 attacks, Republicans have gone on, a xenoph gone on xenophobic tirades against Arabs and Muslims, accusing many of them of being terrorists. Republicans have also massively attacked Latino immigrants. Republicans in recent years have duplicated many of the attacks that they used on black people against Latinos, accusing both groups now of being lazy of mooching off the government, and of being criminals. In 2008, with the candidacy of Barack Obama, all the racists came out of the woodwork. There were allegations that he was Muslim, that he was born in this country, that he was a terrorist sympathizer, that he hated America, that he hated white people, blah, 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 blah. We have a video of it now. Are you listening? Uh, this is the most greatest wealth destruction I've seen by a president. Country. It'd be like Hitler playing golf with Netanyahu. I feel like we are talking to the Germans after uh, an, um, Hitler comes to power. This is what Hitler did with the SS. They're the enemy. Who's the enemy? Uh, Obama! You just think he doesn't care, huh? I think that he... No, I, I really don't. I think if I may say so, there's just too many people who are not going to vote for a black candidate. But... Um, especially a black angry candidate who has a deep-seated hatred for white people i think he is using racial anxiety for political gain this guy is i believe a racist he did make a very racist comment i've got a president who i believe actively dislikes people like me we have to bend over grab the ankles bend over forward backward whichever because his father was black because this is the first black president core ties to the African continent. His having grown up in Kenya. He is defending racists, and when you defend racism and defend racist acts, it's it's virtually the same. Go ahead, say it. Well, in the hizzy. In the, in the hizzy. Hizzy. Don't, Don't we really have to have him in the white hizzy? What's with all the hoods in the hizzy? Kind of a boys in the hood handshake. This is not the guy that you invite to the White House for poetry reading. What he's trying to do is to, cre is to rekindle the sense of black victimization. How does increasing taxes count as spending cuts in your world, Mr. Obama, maybe in Kenya. President say Trayvon could have been me 35 years ago. I guess because what? He was part of the Chum gang and he smoked pot and he did a little blow. You've decided that chugging a few 40s and rediscovering your Irish is more important. If he had been anything other than African-American and 
and I don't mean to cast aspersions on African Americans, but he would have been impeached and convicted by now. He would be impeached if he weren't America's first black president. I think we're getting close to a high crime and misdemeanor. I believe he's the most lawless president in modern times. Former President Richard Nixon, what he did was child's play compared to the range of corruption. Why wouldn't we impeach this president for not protecting and defending Americans in the bloodbath known as Benghazi? Pretty much every day has been an impeachable offense. Can you just show us the birth certificate? Why wouldn't President Obama release his birth certificate? God does not have a birth certificate, neither does Obama. This has clearly been photocopied yes. from a book. You see that? It kind of folds back to like almost like the binding of a book. I've heard that number before, $2 million that he's spending to not have to show the birth certificate. There's a green border around it that had to be photoshopped in. I'm trying to figure out yeah. why they Well, this whole that. border is suspect. If he had immigrated here, he'd probably love America more. <laughs> a fist bump, a pound, a terrorist fist jab. The president just seems to be very uncomfortable being uh, commander-in-chief. Did you see the latte salute? It's not a latte salute, it's a chai salute. Our country's less, less safe today. He believes the bad guys are the American people. Barack Obama apparently is willing to uh, to roll the dice on that because he made these promises. Well, he's rolling them. He because can't if we get hit again, he's and through. There it is again. What is that? That is a flag pin. You're not wearing a lapel pin, are you? I will wear one. And they just hate the flag. Do you notice anything unusual about this picture? There's no Bible. President Obama has offered to, to pay out of his own pocket for the Museum of, of Muslim Culture. He's more concerned about mm -hmm. protecting the image of Islam than protecting the people of the well, United States. And we have a president who is aligned with the jihad force. You're declaring war on this country with a bunch of jihadis you brought in. You did it, you son of a bitch. No, he's not a Muslim. He's an atheist. He's an Arab. His middle name does matter. He wants to be known as Barack Hussein Obama. Here's a person who says he's a Christian. All right, let's take him at face value. Let's just to say that that's correct. But what kind of Christian? Where did he announce? I don't know. Where did he announce this thing? I believe that he is a Muslim. Well, he's not a Muslim. Well, we don't. No, he's not. Well, no, we do know. Yes. How many of you believe that here? Yes. How many believe? I do think it's quite possible he is Muslim, even though he says he is Christian. Why do they think he's a Muslim? Barack Obama's emotional attachment to the Muslim world has hurt the USA. President Obama was soft, almost subservient to the Muslim world. Deep emotional ties to Islam. I don't hate Obama. He's only been to church like four times since he's been president. He golfed 30 times. President Obama has taken fewer vacation days than Ronald Reagan or yeah. uh, Bush the Younger. And you say? I say he should take more. Obama's taking a vacation every five minutes. Where's the leadership? on the golf course is this what leadership looks like 115 or 16 golf outings is he ever working oh, it's not even marxism mm -mm, mm -mm. older than 1848 it was um <sighs> the man who portrays the devil looks a lot like the president of the united states folks i've been told this by high up folks they say listen Obama and Hillary both smell like sulfur. They smell like hell. We're the young girl saying, no, no, help me, and the government is Roman Polanski. President Obama who wants mandate circumcision. I feel like President Obama is just saying, you know what? <laughs> but our president is frankly out of his mind. You're a slime ball that hates this country and is allied with a bunch of people wearing nightgowns. He bashes FNC more than ISIS, and we don't behead anybody. I just love my country. <laughs> The varmint that is currently infesting the Oval Office got started politically by questioning Obama's place of birth. Trump also ran his 2016 campaign with racist attacks against virtually every ethnic group in America. Trump attacked an Indiana-born judge for his family heritage, called Mexicans rapists and murderers, attacked a Gold Star family on the basis of their faith, said to black people, What do you have to lose? I mean, what do black people have to lose with Republicans in power besides their right to vote, affirmative action, public assistance programs, their respect, their dignity, and possibly their lives? Since the 2016 election, racists have been emboldened, with hate crimes increasing dramatically since then, including the recent tragic events in Charlottesville, Virginia. America has had a long and disturbing racial history, and Republican politicians still play on racial fears to get elected. Race has always been used to divide, divide people against each other. In the words of President Lyndon Johnson, if you can convince the lowest white man he's better than the best colored man, he won't notice you're picking his pocket. He'll give him someone to look down on, he'll empty his pockets for you. 
The only way to stop this is to directly engage and counterattack on these issues. We can no longer afford to allow racial issues to convince the average white person to vote for Republicans who are going to screw them. And us. Furthermore, the spread of these ideas is dangerous to a modern civilized society and encourages terrorism and violence. We must ensure that these ideas do not spread any further. Thank you for watching the program. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe for more interesting content.